to this episode of Davar Word. It is my pleasure to share with you what I have discovered in my walk so that we can learn and grow together. What is passing on the torch? This metaphoric expression alludes to the ancient Greek torch race in which a lighted torch was passed from one runner to the next. How could a legend like Moses be replaced? God had a plan for this very important transition and Moses was obedient to it. Moses responded to God with a worshipful petition. He asked the Lord to appoint the next leader so that the people would not be left like sheep without a shepherd. Moses laid hands on Joshua, signifying a formal passing on of leadership, responsibilities and authority. There was no sign that Moses was jealous or bitter. We pray for new believers who may struggle with inexperience. The Lord will give them the spirit of leadership and guide them to the right mentors and resources that will equip them to lead well. Moses, having seen his sister and brother die, knew that his own time on earth was coming to a close. He prayed to God to appoint a successor. Numbers 27, verses 16 to 17. Let the Lord, God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over this community who will go out before them and come in before them, who will lead them out and bring them home. Let not the Lord's community be like sheep without a shepherd. What was Moses' reason for making this request after declaring the order of inheritance? Zelophehad had five daughters, Mahla, Noah, Hogla, Milcah, and Tirzah. See, a woman named Noah in the scriptures. Zelophehad had no sons. The five sisters came forth and they spoke with determination to Moses that the continuity of family name depended on inheritance of the land. They brought their case before Moses that the current law was not adequate. It did not take into account the unusual circumstances of a man without sons. They considered God's law to be just and they showed no hesitation in pointing out the unfair nature of the present situation with complete confidence and supporting their claim with compelling arguments. So you see, five females came to hound Moses. Moses must have had a headache. I believe he had no peace until their case was settled. Of course, Moses brought their case before God. A new and permanent law was made to secure inheritance for any daughters in such circumstances. Finally, there was land named after the daughters of Zelophehad. When the daughters of Zelophehad inherited from their father, Moses reasoned, the time is right for me to make my own request. If daughters and girls can inherit, I hope that my sons should inherit my calling too. Moses asked God to choose a leader over Israel to lead them after his death. Moses saw that God had commanded for Zelophehad's inheritance to be given to his daughters. And he thought, now is the time for me to ask God to give my leadership as an inheritance to my children so that they may lead Israel as I have led them. But God replied, this is not my decision. Rather, Joshua who served you faithfully did not leave your tent and learned all the scriptures. He shall inherit your leadership and shall lead Israel into the land. Numbers 27 verses 12 to 13 The Lord said to Moses, Go up this mountain of Abarim and gaze upon the land that I have given to the Israelites. After you have seen it, you too will be gathered to your people like Aaron your brother. God was telling Moses he would soon die. Why did God need to add, like Aaron, your brother? Perhaps Moses wanted to die the way Aaron did. The Kataf Sofer explains, Aaron had the privilege of knowing that his children would follow in his footsteps. Eleazar, his son, was appointed as high priest in his lifetime. 
To this day, the Kohanim, or priests, are the direct descendants of Aaron. Likewise, Moses longed to see one of his sons, Gershom or Eliezer, take his place as leader of the people. It was not to be. In the book of Judges, there was a man named Micah. He established an idolatrous cult in the territory of Ephraim at the north of Israel. He hired a Levite, a descendant of Levi, to be a priest in the shrine. There were some men from the tribe of Dan who relocated to the north to find more suitable land for themselves. They came upon Micah's house and seized both the idolatrous items and the Levite priest. The men from the tribe of Dan persuaded this Levite to become their priest. Judges 18.19 They said, Come with us and be our father and priest. Isn't it better that you serve a tribe and clan in Israel as priest rather than just one man's household? Judges 18.30 Then the children of Dan set up for themselves the carved image and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. In our English Bibles, the name of the idolatrous priest is Jonathan, son of Gershom, son of Manasseh. But let me tell you the truth, Manasseh is actually Moses. In the Hebrew Torah scroll, the letter Nun has been inserted into the name so that it can be read as Manashe rather than Moshe. The letter Nun, or N, is written above the line, not on the same line. The reason that the letter Nun was added was to avoid smearing the name of Moses himself by revealing that his grandson had become an idolatrous priest. Vayakimu lahem bene dan et hapasel ve honatan ben Gershom ben Menashe hu uvanaf kohanim leshevet hadani ad yom gelot haaretz. How are we to explain Moses' apparent failure with his own children and grandchildren? Perhaps for years, Moses lived in Midian with his father-in-law Jethro, who was at the time an idolatrous priest. Perhaps the Midianite influence reappeared in Jonathan three generations later. Perhaps Moses himself was so preoccupied with leading the people of Israel that he simply did not have time to attend to the spiritual needs of his own children. In Exodus 18, verses 1 to 6, remember when Jethro came to visit Moses, his son-in-law, after the crossing of the Red Sea, Jethro brought with him Zipporah, the wife of Moses, and their two sons, Gershom and Eliezer. The family had not been together with Moses for a very long time until they reunited. Authority in virtue of office can be passed down from parent to child. Monarchy or kingship could be passed down from parent to child. The eldest son of a king would be king. In religious leadership like the priesthood, the son of the high priest would become high priest. Kingship and priesthood were dynastic and could be passed down from parent to child. But as for a prophet, we never hear of prophetic anointing being passed down from father to son. Prophetic anointing is never automatically handed on across the generations. Moses was a prophet, but he failed to pass down his role to his sons. A priest cannot be king and a king cannot be priest. There is only one person who can be all three, Yeshua HaMashiach. The office of prophet is the best crown. To be a prophet is to be the mouth of God. God did not want this anointing to pass from parent to child in dynastic succession. Why? The Torah or the scriptures or the instructions of God belong to anyone who chooses to take hold of it and be responsible for it. The scriptures are an inheritance of the congregation, not just an elite chosen person. The king passes down the authority to rule. The priest passes down the opportunity to serve. But to represent the mouth of God as prophet, this does not pass down. The mouth of God is the word of God. 
whoever wants to bring the word of God, it is available to you and me as long as we really hear God and speak His word. Abraham fathered Ishmael. Isaac and Rebekah gave birth to Esau. Three of Jacob's children disappointed their father. Reuben slept with Bilhah, his father's concubine. Shimon and Levi, some traditions say that they were twins. One man raped their sister Dina and they took revenge and killed the men of the entire city. In Genesis 49 verse 6, Jacob dissociated himself from them. Even so, the three great leaders of the Israelites throughout the Exodus were all children of Levi, Moses, Aaron and Miriam. Solomon, the wisest man on earth, had a son called Rehoboam, a complete fool. His disastrous leadership divided the kingdom of Israel. Hezekiah, one of Judah's greatest kings, was the father of Manasseh, one of the most evil kings. Hezekiah was married to prophet Isaiah's daughter. Manasseh was the grandson of Isaiah the prophet. While Isaiah the prophet was hiding inside the hollow tree, Manasseh ordered for the tree to be sawn in half and killed his own grandfather. Not all parents succeed with all their children all the time. How could it be otherwise? We each possess freedom. To some extent, we choose who we become. Neither genes nor upbringing can guarantee that we become the person our parents wanted us to be. It is also not right that parents should overimpose their will on children who have reached the age of maturity. Abraham did not become an idolater like his father Terach. Manasseh, the evil king, was grandfather to King Josiah, one of the very best kings of Judah. There is a genealogy in Numbers 3. It begins with the words, These are the children of Aaron and Moses. But the genealogy only lists Aaron's children. Moses' children are not listed. Perhaps Moses taught his nephews Aaron's children, and they were regarded as his own. It was common practice to call disciples as children. In the New Testament, Yeshua called his disciples children. 1 Chronicles 23 verses 15 to 16 says, The sons of Moses were Gershom and Eliezer. Of the sons of Gershom, Shebuel was the first or the leader. 1 Chronicles 24 20 And the rest of the sons of Levi, of the sons of Amram, Shubael, of the sons of Shubael, Jedeah. These passages refer to Gershom's son, not as Jonathan, but as Shevual or Shuvael, which is translated as return to God. In other words, Jonathan, the idolatrous priest, eventually repented of his idolatry and became a faithful Jew. However far a child has drifted, he or she may come back after some time. Moses' grandson Jonathan returned and became Shevuel. Consider the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15, verses 11 to 32. The parable is about a man who had two sons, and the younger of them asked his father to give him his share of the estate. The son could not wait for his father's death to get his inheritance. He wanted it immediately. He wished his father was dead. Upon receiving his portion of the inheritance, the younger son travelled to a distant country where he indulged in extravagant living. He drank, gambled and slept with prostitutes during this time. However, it wasn't long before he exhausted all his money and then a permanent famine struck the land. The young man's actions did not lead to success. He squandered his inheritance. His possessions were sold to pay his debts. This left him desperately poor. He eventually became a hired servant with the degrading job of looking after pigs, an abomination to the Jewish people because they considered pigs as unclean animals. The young man reached the point of desiring the food of the pigs and then he finally came to his senses and he arose and came to his father but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. 
the father was watching hopefully for the son's return. The son started admitting his sins and declaring himself unworthy of being a son. But before he could finish talking, his father accepted him back wholeheartedly without hesitation. The father called for his servants to dress the son in the finest robe available, to get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and to slaughter the fatted calf for a celebratory dinner party. As physical or spiritual parents, one of our first duties is to ensure that our spiritual children know and love our religious heritage. But sometimes we fail. Children may go their own way, which is not the way of the parents. Not everyone succeeded with all their children. Not even Abraham or Moses or David or Solomon. Not even God himself. God is the perfect parent who never made mistakes, and yet not all his children turned out well. Isaiah 1 verse 2 says, I have raised children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. Prophet Malachi wrote in chapter 3 verse 24 that God would turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Those who are estranged will be reunited in faith and love. Moses almost never really connected with his own children. The Lord told Moses to lay his hands on Joshua, symbolizing a transfer of authority and spiritual power upon Joshua. The laying on of hands ritual signifies an investment of identity into the successor. Moses placed his hands on his successor Joshua and granted Joshua a measure of his own authority and anointing to lead Israel into the promised land. Moses himself stepped out of his traditional family unit to pass on his authority to the son of another man, Joshua. Joshua may be identified as the son of Nun, but the true father-son relationship in his life was Moses. Why was Joshua chosen? Proverbs 27, 18 He who tends a fig tree will enjoy its fruit. Whoever takes care of his master will be honoured. The instruction of God or the commandments of God is compared to a fig tree. The fruit of most trees, the olive tree, the grapevine, the date palm, is gathered all at once. But the fruit of the fig tree is gathered a little at a time, and so too, is the scriptures. Today we study a little and tomorrow we study more. It is not taught in a year nor in two. Joshua spent 40 years learning under Moses. God told Moses to put his hand on Joshua, but Moses put both hands. Numbers 27, 18, Adonai said to Moses, Take Joshua son of Nun and lay your hand on him. Numbers 22, verses 22 to 23, Moses did as Adonai commanded him. He took Joshua, stood him before Eleazar the Kohen and all the entire assembly. Then he laid his hands on him and commissioned him just as Adonai had spoken by Moses' hand. God said to Moses to put your hand, singular, on Joshua. Moses put both hands, indicating that Moses held nothing back from Joshua. Moses gave Joshua everything and taught him everything. Moses did not hold back secrets or tricks of the trade. Sometimes a mentor teaches us some things and he purposely lets us figure out some things ourselves so that we don't have it too easy. But that's not what Moses did. He just gave everything to Joshua. In passing down leadership to Joshua, someone not in Moses' own family Moses gains in the end. Until today, we are talking about Moses, who has passed down so much to each of us. We inherit the legacy of Moses. The biological family unit isn't the only way to find deep connection and meaning in passing down something of value. Passing on a legacy can happen in a multiplicity of ways. We may not all have children, even if we do have biological children, despite doing our very best, we may find them following a different path to what we believe in. But we can all leave something behind that will live on, perhaps in someone else who is not flesh and blood. 
we can always do so by following Moses' example, teaching, facilitating, or encouraging the next generation. When our children or those we disciple follow our path, we should be grateful. When they go beyond us, we should give special thanks to God. And when they choose to go another way, we must be patient, knowing that the greatest prophet of all time, Moses, also had the same experience with one of his grandchildren. And we must never give up hope. What do we do from here? Let's not shape our reality with ungodly thoughts. Always know that someone is watching us, learning from us. Listen to the Word of God. Listen to Psalms, to the prophets. Don't just zone out in life. Think of someone we can encourage and disciple. We have to hand over the vision from one generation to the next. Plan and strategize how to pass on the torch. Plan how to disciple someone younger in the faith. Let us design our own project of investing into someone's life and changing the world. Remember that we can have spiritual offspring. We can invest in our own spiritual successor and leave our own legacy in this world. 1 Kings 2 verse 4 And that the Lord may keep His promise to me, if your descendants watch how they live, and if they walk faithfully before me with all their heart and soul, you will never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. God will keep His promise to King David that He will never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. That will be the Messiah Yeshua, the Lord, who is coming again in the future. Let us pray. Lord Messiah, Saviour, Bread of Life, please reveal to us your divinely chosen successor in our lives. Show us who is the Joshua in our lives. Joshua was described as a man in whom is the Spirit. Joshua had accompanied Moses part of the way up Mount Sinai. He had guarded the tent of meeting and he had led the army in victorious battle against Amalek. Help us impart and invest ourselves into the Joshuas who cross our paths in our lives. In the mighty name of Yeshua, Beshem Yeshua, Bezekut Yeshua, Sa Shalom. Amen. Let that sink into our spirits. Thank you for joining me. I pray that this message inspires and challenges you. God bless you and your family. Shalom. <music>